What is up, Rad fans? How you doing? How you living? Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. And I promise this intro will not be so long. My guest for this episode is Grace Brown, a staff writer at Wired in the UK. And I came across two of her articles recently in the last several months uh, that really stuck out to me. And I'll just read you the titles of these two pieces. The first was The Therapy Part of Psychedelic Therapy is a mess. And the second, psychedelic therapy is here, just don't call it therapy. Grace will break down both of these pieces and what exactly they are about in our discussion, but what drew me to these articles and what made me really want to ask her to come on the show was that she's tackling the gray areas in psychedelic research. The idea that we don't even really know what's going on in terms of how psychedelics work really how therapy works from a mechanistic level. We have a pretty good understanding of, you know, the, the types of therapies and they've been accredited. I don't mean to, to call into question therapy, but it's a very subjective thing. And then you add in the subjective experience of a psychedelic, plus all of the nuances that come with set and setting, and you get this really, really, really nuanced sort of gray soup and no one really knows how it works. Uh, I tackled the same sort of angle in the podcast I did for Undark magazine. And the second one uh, highlights a really interesting case study about the decriminalization or the push to have psychedelics available outside of the clinic. And Grace will explain that the situation that is unfolding in Oregon, you've probably heard about Oregon and their move to provide uh, psychedelic experiences to people, but we're not calling it therapy. And yet the language describing some of these experiences looks a lot like the, the language used in the therapy circles. So again, another horrendous gray area, but also really, really interesting. And so, like I said, this was to see someone writing about these kind of things was really great. And I really wanted to speak with her because this has kind of been my interest in psychedelics. As you've listened to this show, you will know that my views on it have evolved. And trying to take a critical look at this, I don't know, research phenomenon really is sometimes difficult uh, because A, it's new. There's new data coming in all the time. Uh, a lot of the data that we have now is at early stages, so it might not be that conclusive. Uh, there's a lot of things happening, a lot of people looking at different aspects of it. There's just the nature of these experiences, like I said, that are so subjective. Uh, they don't lend themselves well to our... Um, traditional uh, scientific methods of scrutiny, but there's also this hype. One researcher has even termed this the pollen effect due to the success of Michael Pollan's book about psychedelics. And there is perhaps an expectation being created about the, the wonderful success of this research and how these things could benefit so many people. And again, not really... Uh, reporting on maybe some of the negative aspects, negative as aspects being there's a long history of a dark side to psychedelic communities uh, that involves cults and the exploitation of vulnerable people. Uh, look no further than the Manson family. Negative experiences in general uh, are, are kind of underreported, let's say, and there's a lot of truisms that we just sort of say about psychedelics that we don't really have a lot of hard data one way or the other on. For example, that negative experiences uh, and going through those are just part and parcel with how this works. Maybe, and for some people, sure. But it's, it's hard to draw uh, blanket statements from anything to do with psychedelics. We also have, you know, fads that come and go like microdosing. Not a lot of data on microdosing and whether it's actually effective for the things that people say that it is. Uh, we just, in general, don't know how psychedelics work. Um, some of the other truisms that, that get thrown around are 
psychedelics are dangerous for people with uh, conditions like schizophrenia. Now there's some groups that are looking to actually test the use of psychedelics for treating some of these conditions. Um, myths about the indigenous use or the indigenous practice uh, surrounding these substances. And then there's some of the things that we've talked about in general, too, about a lot of tech and VC money coming in. How is this all going to play out in terms of access and um, authenticity, we could even say, in, in, in the rollout of these both treatments and maybe efforts like in Oregon to offer a way or a pathway to experiencing some of these things um, that is legal, supervised, but not medical, as you can see, it's a whole it's a whole big mess. So these are just some of the topics that we talk about. Uh, we also talked a little bit about, you know, being the ones at the party that have to, uh, you know, check everyone when they start talking about microdosing and be the be the one to be like, well, you know, you know, there's really no data on that. And so it was nice to talk to uh, someone else uh, who has done a lot of the same reading, done a lot of the same research, and uh, is coming at this topic with this same sort of positive, supportive, yet skeptical and um, inquisitive curiosity, you know, based approach, I guess is what I'm trying to say as I kind of ramble on in this intro. So I'm going to cut it off there. There's lots of great links in the show notes to this in this episode uh, to as many of the articles that came up uh, in the conversation that I could find and link to. I've added them there. Grace's work will be in the show notes. Her Twitter will be in the show notes. Twitter, I don't know what X. I can't bring myself to say like this. Just sounds so dumb. Anyway, uh, her Twitter handle will be in the show notes, which is at Grace F Brown. That's Brown with an E on the end. Uh, and yeah, please, as always, get in touch with me uh, with any comments or questions or anything about anything you're hearing on this show or things that you would like me to discuss uh, in future episodes, you can do that by going to our website, twobreadforyou.wordpress.com. Uh, you can reach out to me on X or Instagram uh, at twobreadforyou on both of those platforms. And uh, we have an email, twobreadforyou at gmail.com. So please feel free to get in touch. And again, as always, subscribe like, review, all of those great things wherever you're getting your podcasts, and that really helps us out in terms of our visibility. Share this episode with your friends uh, if you thought it was, was interesting. Tell other people about it. Be that annoying person at the party that tells everyone about the great new podcast that they're listening to, that one being, of course, too bad for you. Thank you guys, as always, for tuning in. Here is my conversation with staff writer at Wired UK, Grace Brown. Mm. Podcasting, you're speaking to really one person because that headphones, right? Most people listen mm, to headphones. That's interesting, yeah. And that, yeah. yeah, that really like kind of resonated with me where it is like you, that's why, you know, people get so passionate about these podcasts. Like Serial was a great yeah. example, right? Yeah. You know, and it's because you really feel like you have that one-on-one -on -one with the, with the host, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I totally know. agree. I, I love ones that like feel like you're either chatting to the person or it's like two people chatting and you're kind of like eavesdropping on a conversation. They're my favorite ones. Yeah. Yeah. And who would have thought, yeah. you know, that this would be the, this would be the format, you know, <laughs> just know. turn on the mic and, <laughs> but we all love to be part of these conversations. So, yeah, I mean, we've basically started already, but let me just, you know, Grace Brown from yeah. Wired. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for, for joining the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, we could probably go on and on and on about pod. We could do a whole show about podcasts, but I brought you here. I asked you on and you gracious, graciously accepted for a specific reason to talk about some of your reporting for Wired on psychedelics, a topic that I'm also very interested in. But let's just rewind for a second and let me ask you about your journey to where you are in your career now. Um, were you always interested in journalism or science and tech? 
was science and tech journalism something that you set out to do or you just kind of found yourself at Wired, a science and tech focused magazine? Um, I think I have the very classic tale that I think a lot of people who started off in science with a science background have to science journalism, which is that I did a degree in science. I have a bachelor's in neuroscience and I was getting to kind of the end of my degree and spending a lot of time in the lab. I was just definitely not enjoying it. It was probably because I kept going to the labs, like really hung over and they'd be like, <laughs> you have to like, you have to wrap a rat intestines around this like pipette. And I'd be like, okay, I'm going to vomit. Um, <laughs> maybe this career isn't for me. Um, and I kind of got, yeah, I got to the final year and a lot of my friends were going down the kind of like pharma route. And I, that didn't really appeal to me a lot. And I think I remember like literally Googling um, jobs you can do with a science degree that aren't, that isn't science. <laughs> I've, been there. I've probably been to those same <laughs> yeah. websites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, science writing, science journalism comes up. Um, and I'd always been really interested in reading and writing and that kind of stuff. So I felt kind of like a, a natural fit. And I started writing for my student newspaper and really enjoyed that. And then I did a master's in science communication at Imperial College London. Um, and around that time, I started freelancing for a few outlets like um, New Scientist, um, BBC Future, places like that. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed it. And then I finished the master's um, and had a good six, seven months hardcore of being unemployed. Um, but freelancing at the same time. Um, and then I got my job at Wired and it was like, I think that was like January, 2021. So um, like the first day I joined, they're like, you need to write like this piece ASAP on COVID. So I was like, just straight onto the COVID <laughs> coverage, which was um, very, very nice to start my first full-time job um, in such a frantic environment. Mm -hmm. But um, it, felt, it felt good to be able to contribute in some way, at least during like such a like awful time. Um, and yeah, I've been at Wired now for about two and a half years. Um, yeah, it's about two and a half years. And once the kind of COVID frenzy settled down a little bit, I was able to kind of um, carve out my niche a little bit more. And yeah, part of that niche, you know, obviously I have this background in neuroscience. Um, and I think kind of all roads kind of led here because my dissertation supervisor um, during my undergraduate was obsessed with psychedelics <laughs> um I'm not sure like I think academically and but also probably recreationally yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um so yeah he used to talk about them all the time he's like you know just go off on tangents about them like during our lectures and stuff like that um and so yeah I was I was really interested in them um and I could tell I think what's interesting and we'll talk about this a little bit more is I think I actually came to covering psych covering psychedelics at you know what I think is the best time I kind of came to it kind of like when a lot of the initial kind of media hype was starting to die down a little bit like it's obviously still very prevalent but I think you know all the big kind of cover stories like um magic mushrooms will cure your depression they'd already kind of been done mm -hmm. and I think I think probably if I'd come to it like a little bit earlier um that would have been what I that's what it would have been how I covered it as well because you know I think I think it's probably a fallibility of science journalism is to you know like there's this new novel treatment on like something like psychedelics why wow, so interesting you know they've been so verboten for so long mm -hmm. but now they're being um you know brought into the mainstream the novelty of that I think would kind of prevent you from exploring kind of the intricacies of what that actually means in practice um so yeah like I said I think I came to it at a good time where I could kind of um I had the space and the leeway to kind of get into maybe some of the more controversial aspects of what a psychedelic medicine actually means um and also people were starting to have those conversations I think I think you know from chatting to um, academics in this space um, who are more open to talking about, um, you know, the, the critiques and downsides of psychedelics. And obviously we'll get into that a little bit. Um, they, I think they've only felt the kind of space themselves to be able to acknowledge those recently, because obviously they've, they've just managed to be able to start researching it for the first time. You know, they've been scheduled on drugs and um, most of the world for, you know, 40 years or so. Um, they're only just now being able to study them. So I think there's been this kind of reticence in the community 
psychedelic community to kind of acknowledge those downsides for fear of, you know, backsliding back into that kind of war on drugs mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. I think I feel like so much of the same, so much of the same in, in a lot of what you just said there in terms of going into science writing, same thing. I found myself in the lab mm. being like, mm -hmm. not being super good at taking meticulous notes for things, you know, mm -hmm. and having to pipette mm -hmm. a million things and being like, I'm not very good at this. Like this, I, yeah. I, I'm so fascinated <laughs> by it, but I'm not very good at it. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I got my PhD, so I, you know, I, good enough. You persevered. Right? I persevered, <laughs> right? I had a lot of help. I was like, good supervisors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, and then it's like, no, 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 science is interesting, fascinating, but I don't want to do it. I want to talk about it. I want to, you know, exactly. explore it from that other angle. So I, I resonate yeah. with you there. And then that same thing that you're saying too, that there was that initial hype about psychedelics and you could see it in, yeah, in circles of academia. And I imagine neuroscience, it would have been more prevalent where like respectable people are talking mm -hmm. about their own experiences or their own, you know, like this stigma really was sort of lifted on it. And there was that initial wave of coverage where it's like, ooh, this might actually be beneficial, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and I think that now we're dealing with, like you said, like a little bit later, there's more data that comes out. We can be a little more critical. Mm -hmm. People are open to being more critical. I think mm -hmm. I still feel when I do interviews in this space too, there is a reticence, like people are very worried about backsliding, like you say. Yeah. But um I think that that initial wave of of optimism and that oh this can be used for something has also kind of maybe tainted the conversation because now it's all about this medicalization of it and mm -hmm. I think that's another gray mm -hmm. area but let's start there with this sort of this is how the door was opened was this might be a useful tool for what you now call psychedelic assisted therapy. So for people with, I believe PTSD and treatment resistant depression is where the majority of studies have been done. There's a little bit now in addictions, but the majority mm -hmm. of stuff is in PTSD, treatment resistant depression. And the first piece of yours that I read, paraphrasing the, the headline a bit, but basically the therapy part of psychedelic therapy is a mess. And this was something I kind of explored in a piece I did for Undark, because my question that I pitched to the magazine was, this is happening. We have all these studies about psychedelic assisted therapy. And in that, you have therapists administering psychedelic ass assisted therapy. But who, who trained them to do psychedelic assisted therapy? Like, what is that? What is the manual? Where does it come from? And it's kind of like nobody really knows. <laughs> And I've got the sense in your piece as well that, that you were you were tapping into this as well. So how did you come to it for that piece specifically? And then we can discuss, you know, like, do you feel the same way that it, there's a, it's a kind of a wild west out there? I was just going to say it's it's a complete wild west. And I think there, there's been so many questions around the therapy component, um, you know, because, you know, if it, if it is the case, we're going to medicalize these therapies, it's seeming like they're going to be really expensive because, you know, if you have to pay for one to two therapists for an eight hour trip, that's going to be really, really expensive. So I think, I think that the, you know, obviously there's a lot of divergence within the field itself with how essential the therapy actually is. Some people think it's, you know, absolutely critical on where the actual therapy value lies. Some people think we can actually just get rid of it and it'll probably be the same. Um, so I, I was interested from that perspective, but it was actually, um, a source of mine, Nishay Devineau, who I think she's at John Hopkins now, had written an editorial for JAMA. Um, and she'd worked with um, a, a patient of MAPS, which is like the biggest nonprofit um, right. leading kind of the psychedelic renaissance at the moment. Um, and Megan had been sexually assaulted after she had participated in um, a trial for MDMA for treating PTSD. Um, and so this editorial was co-written with Megan and another researcher called Sarah McNamee. And basically in this editorial, they, they call this out, they call out just how little evidence there is to support the kind of norms of psychedelic assisted therapy, because they're, they're pretty odd when you think about some of them, <laughs> like the idea of nurturing touch, like your therapist is encouraged to 
hold your hands or hug you or massage you. Um, or this this idea of focus body work where they're encouraged to like push against you. Um, you know, and they kind of call out this idea of just like a complete lack of rigor or evidence to support um, these norms. And yeah, I think, like you said, I was just really interested to know where they've even come from. Um, and when you do trace it back, a lot of it just goes back to um, the work of Stan Groff from the 60s on LSD. And then that was kind of adapted into MAPS um, MDMA protocol. Um, with and, and, and then from there, people have just kind of, taken that protocol and then just you know applied it across the board applied for it psilocybin for treatment resistant depression or you know like yeah for um uh substance use disorders all that kind of stuff um and different research groups at different universities um or um companies are all just kind of following this protocol that does not have a ton of evidence to support it um and then even when it comes something that i'm really interested in as well um with psychedelics is um you know, this idea of kind of hype and um, everyone being so excited about them, but the evidence to show how effective they are at actually treating these disorders um, is super nascent. It's still like in this really early stages. And the stuff that's coming out so far, like, isn't mind blowing. You're not, it's definitely like, we know now it's definitely not a miracle cure, at least from the mm -hmm. pretty small studies that have been done. So I'm really interested in kind of, like, there's a lot of debate, I think, within the academic community about like how best to design the trials as well um and so i was interested you know if if it is the case that like the psychotherapy component is like at least half of you know where the therapy benefit of psychedelic assisted therapy lies um is anybody measuring you know how much of an influence that has is it being standardized standardized across the board is everybody employing the exact same methodology um the answer to that is like a big fat no like it's kind of all over the place people could kind of it, it seems to be kind of like vibes you can go off like whatever you feel like doing yeah, yeah, yeah. um and i just think you know if we're do if we're relying on these randomized control trials for you know say fda approval um but like one half of the of the intervention is completely random um how is that going to work? That was just, yeah, I think that was something that I was really interested in exploring as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of what I found too. And I ended up in this interview for the, for the piece I did for Undark with a therapist who was one, mm -hmm. had one of the first um, training programs, like accredited training programs for psychedelic assisted therapists. It was in California. And I was just like, I wasn't coming at it from, I felt like she thought I was coming at it from like a gotcha. Like I was trying to like mm. poke holes in all this and stuff. And I wasn't, I was legit just like naive to how this works. And and essentially my question was like, yeah, but how do you know one therapy works better than the other? You know, like when you take the psychedelic away. Right. And mm -hmm. she was just like, what are you like? You can't, you're, you're coming at this with your science brain where you got these randomized controls and you can't do that with therapy because of so, it's so subjective. It's so, yeah. and then she did inform me that there is like this, you know, it's, it's not, you know, RCT data, but it's like observational data and all of this other stuff where there's like seven, seven or eight principles. I don't know. I can't remember that are known to be associated with better outcomes. And it's like relationship mm -hmm. with your therapist and like these kind of things. So there's that. So she was like, we build on that. But then when it came to the actual specific like psychedelic part, it's like you said, that's where it's like there's there's no standardization. Um, and you think about things again, like it's it's such a subjective thing. Mm -hmm. Feels like we're doing a lot of like w just look back at psychedelic literature, non medic you know, just like trippy stuff from the 60s mm -hmm. and like what's a good set and setting. Mm -hmm. soft lighting, you know, yeah. like all of these things. So it's in a way it's common sense, like to anyone that's, you know, tripped or done psychedelics, it's like, yeah. Yeah. But then you think like, I talked with another uh, science philosopher and he was like, well, you have soft music. That seems to be the, the, the standard, but what if someone's like really into metal, you know? And yeah. like, that's what, that's what might do it for them. You know, it's like, so there's no, yeah. and you can't, so you can't make these. And that's the thing that I think, kind of came out to me was like the randomized control trial for something of this nature is a very poor mechanism for determining yeah. you yeah. know whether it works or not but then you're left with well what else do you do 
And that's the thing is like a lot of people in this field, they feel passionate that it works or that it can work, that it could provide relief to some people. So they're kind of like, let's play the game as mm -hmm. best we can. But what, what, where are we left with that? I don't know. It's a very interesting thing. And I think something that not a lot of people know outside of, you know, researching. Yeah. This. Yeah. I, do, I think, yeah, exactly. I think that's the inherent conflict of what's kind of going on. I think, I think it's something that's really specific to psychedelics as well, because um, it's kind of it, where it's, where it's meeting now is this kind of medicalization, regulatory, you know, very black and white um, approval pathway kind of um, clashing with, you know, psychedelics have such a rich cultural history. Sometimes that can verge on maybe a little bit cultish, you know, people <laughs> feel very strongly about them. Yeah. And so, and like you said, like what that therapist said to you, so I've, I see that a lot as well, that um, try, it's kind of like, you know, um, square peg, round hole, like maybe mm -hmm. they don't fit together, but I mean, I, I, I'm not going to see the FDA, you know, changing that just for something like psychedelics. Um, no. I have seen, seen people calling for maybe, maybe like real life data, would be a better way of doing it maybe like switching up the clinical trial format um but then i've seen other people saying that like doing away with the randomized control um is a little bit premature and that like maybe it just need, needs tweaking but yeah i think there's just so many problems when it comes to rcts and psychedelics like even I, I, i'm not like an expert on this so i probably mess up um talking about it like the idea of blinding the way it's impossible to blind mm -hmm. really because obviously you know if you're seeing like god lining shining down <laughs> on you probably you're probably gonna guess that you're on psilocybin <laughs> um, <laughs> um yeah there has so been some think, studies yeah, though where um, they did give they did administer placebo uh like they didn't tell anybody i think it was just one study so we'll take it as that but it was essentially the people on placebo reported that a lot of the same things that the people on the active ingredient had and they did mm -hmm. it kind of you know in a way that they they sort of told everyone you're getting it right and then okay, they yeah. had like body sensations and da -da -da -da. so mm -hmm. there is and then that is a whole nother you know box of bees here is like yeah. the, 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 the placebo angle of is this placebo is yeah. just the fact that you think because you've taken this drug that it's going to somehow change your life, you know? And mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with a lot of this because I don't know what your what your thought on it is, but I agree with you that like the evidence isn't overwhelming and you see a lot of I think there was a recent trial with uh, psilocybin that just came out that was like eh, it wasn't that great, you know? Like it mm -hmm. didn't really have that strong of an effect. Yeah. Um but then you have so many anecdotal stories and you see this in popular, like how many celebrities, comedians, blah, 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 all these people that have trauma, depression, whatever, mm -hmm. addiction are talking about how it helped them. Like, how do we weigh this in terms of when we're reporting on it or just as a society talking about it? Like, I don't know if you have any <laughs> thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have such mixed feelings on this. I, I think it's, you know, I think it's interesting that people share their stories. I, I, I think that is interesting, but I think, um, there was an academic, I'm, uh, I have his paper up that, that it literally just came out today, actually. Mm. Um, his name is, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, um, to see Nirani and he, he kind of, um, started the idea of the pollen effect, which is kind of, you know, Michael Pollan's book, um, yeah. how to change your mind. And then that, that really seems to me to be kind of the, what kickstarted this kind of avalanche of interest in mm -hmm. psychedelics. And yes, yeah, so he's coined this term that basically that's another big problem with the trials is that people go in with this expectation, you know, they, they've read Michael Pollan's book. Um, they've heard the stories that people, you know, it cured their PTSD, et cetera. Um, they go into the trial. They don't have an extremely positive experience or they, they come out and they still have treatment resistant depression and sometimes often I've heard from talking to people involved in the trial sometimes they come out and they're like a little bit worse yeah um because they, they've had that expectation and that expectation hasn't been met um but yeah um this academic researcher who coined the pollen effect um put out this paper today and I think they're kind of in the paper they're kind of um trying to push back against this idea of um people sharing overwhelmingly positive experiences because 
it's making it harder to do the actual research we need to do to figure out just how effective these drugs are, which I think is really interesting. Um, you know, should we kind of, and I think from speaking to other people in the field, there's kind of this idea, um, once you do the drugs and you have a very positive experience, you just, you can't keep your mouth shut. You just want to tell everyone. Yeah. And yeah. And in the community, the psychedelic community as well, like in, on social media, et cetera, there's a real, I think kind of pushing of that, like to tell your story, to talk about the positive benefits, to not really talk about the negative aspects either. I think. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, and then, like you said, you kind of alluded to there's a money angle to this too, right? Like the investment that's happening in yeah. some of these companies is huge and it's going to be a costly therapy depending on how it's approved, right? Like if the approval is, like you said, you need two therapists to sit with you for eight hours during the trip. You need X numbers of pre uh, exposure, pre trip therapy, and then post trip integration, whatever they're calling it, you know, that's going to be massively expensive. So there's a financial incentive to talk it up, to get investment, exactly. to get, you know, yeah. how many, you know, tech entrepreneurs are in this space now too. I've even seen yeah. like, I haven't seen them fully came like, but in my reporting from sources talking about like companies that are basically getting set up to, as soon as approval happens, they're going to like market their services to hospitals, to clinics to be like, we can set you up with the best environment. So like that lighting, yeah. that mood, that like, and it's just like, yeah, it's all, it's all coming in. So I don't know. Yeah. I'm a little, I also am torn on it and I try to take that, this like sort of balanced view, I guess, mm. because the way that I see it, and I don't know, I could prove, it could turn out to be wrong. This is just, again, my personal opinion. I don't have a lot of data on it. But it, when you look at harms, cost, benefit kind of thing, there's no, not a lot of evidence for addiction to these things. Mm-hmm. Like there, there is a safety angle that seems a little safer than even some things like SSRIs and some of these other yeah, things, you know, sure. yeah. there's obvious dangers. I have to put that in, you know, like people with schizophrenia and like, so a mm-hmm. lot of the trials do, I think a really good job of really limiting the, the, the participation to anyone with a history or family history of some of these other diseases. Mm-hmm. So in a way I'm kind of like, you know, if, if maybe it's not the miracle cure for everyone, but if it's another tool in the toolbox, it should definitely be explored. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's something I struggle with myself as well. I think I think some of the criticisms people have made against um, the kind of pouring in of VC money and, um, and the likes of investor money and all that kind of stuff into this space, I guess. Um, I guess, number one, obviously, the acknowledgement we have to make the fact that, you know, indigenous um, populations have been using these drugs for millennia and now we have people like Christian Angamar kind of wading in and patenting everything they can see around them um, I think that's an obvious disclosure we have to make um, but for the money aspect I, I don't I don't think that's necessarily a fault of the of the industry I think I think like you said it's just the fact that this thing this aspect costs money you know if it is the case that it's going to be therapists leading it you know therapists have spent a lot of time training and deserve to be well paid for what they do. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to see what plays out in, you know, say if, if the FDA does approve um, MDMA to treat PTSD, what that's going to look like, you know, will insurance companies cover that? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, even look at Australia, you know, they just, they've just started their MDMA and psilocybin um, therapeutic program. And I think it costs maybe like 20 to 30 K to do to partake which yeah. i mean I don't, I don't know who has that money <laughs> yeah, yeah um yeah yeah well and that's and then the, yeah there's this whole exclusion like are the people who need it the most going to be able to access it because of that price sure. tag right um, and yeah. but so again it kind of comes back to this well you gotta you gotta sort of play the game to get the approval so the, the insurance companies can cover it so that there's liability and all of this yeah. stuff but uh I wonder, have in in the course of your reporting, have you talked to? And I'm just asking because you you I now know you have a neuroscience background. Have you talked to the people that have done like a lot of that fMRI work and stuff like that? To because there's a there's a whole neurobiology angle as well that again I don't 
like I talked to some folks from Imperial, David Nutt, and mm. from that group, from the Carhartt Harris group, uh, mm-hmm. and they seem to have this theory of how the changes in the brain, the brain chemistry, is actually leading to like a loosening of, you know, the brain's defense mechanism, allowing yeah. you to access these things, which is a nice story. But I don't know, like, again, don't know how, yeah. how real that is, you know, or how you yeah. would prove that, right? Yeah. I think that's also such an interesting aspect of this. Um, Stat News, actually, Olivia Goldhill, who does a lot of reporting around psychedelics as well, put out a really good piece that basically is like, we still don't actually know how psychedelics mm-hmm. work. That was a great piece. Um, I know that one. Yeah. 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 And just all these different theories are floating around um, again. And like you said, so hard to prove and like there's a whole debate about fMRI studies being pretty shit in um, neuroscience as well <laughs> um so yeah I mean I I can't really speak to it a ton like I've only I've probably read exactly what you read um but I do feel like that's I mean I, there are therapies that we don't know how they work and we just prescribe them anyway like SSRIs we don't really know how antidepressants yeah. work yeah yeah um does that matter a whole time? I think it probably does matter a bit, maybe, but maybe we can still plow ahead without fully understanding them. Well, I guess that's the benefit of of the RCT framework is that you it is good at showing harm, right? Like you can see mm, if for sure if the the active side of the of the trial is experiencing some kind of physical and or you know mental harm afterwards. So at least you get that you get that sort of safety you know sort of angle. Um, the other interesting one in this in this space uh, is a debate that I stumbled upon, and not a lot of people subscribe to this side of it, but there's a group in Switzerland that does, where they're all about sort of doing psychoanalysis while under the influence, while the patient is under oh. the influence. And that to me just seems crazy, you know, like that seems wow. like a recipe for disaster, but I don't know. And it brought up... To me, I kind of always, I'll be honest here, I always kind of thought like the Freudian psychoanalysis thing was like coming from North America. I grew up in Canada and I moved Mm -hmm. to Europe, uh, moved to Germany like six, seven years ago, now in Belgium. But in North America, it was like, yeah, that's, nobody does that. That's, it's just, it's make believe, you know? And then I moved to Germany and there's like a lot of serious people that do that. And it's like, it's on offer and stuff. So I was always like, yeah, but that's not real, is it? Like, you're just like some guys just interpreting your dreams, basically. Like, that's what it felt like to me. So I don't really, you know, I I don't know enough about it to critique it. But then when I heard that, like, and it was a Swiss group, which I think is, of course, Freud, Switzerland, like there's a there's a history Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But they're like, no, 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 we should definitely like probe people and go deep while they're while they're under the influence that's where you get the like the you know unloosen the knots or whatever but whoa (laughs) that's really have you uh, there's been some talk that like psychoanalysis is is, like on the comeback that are like younger people are really interested in it um as like a as opposed to you i feel like everything these days tends to be cbt cognitive behavioral therapy um and yeah, some people are preferring, yeah, psychoanalysis, which I think is really interesting as well. I did, I had psychoanalytic um, therapy once as well, and I really did enjoy it. It's all like, it's, you know, how did your dad traumatize you, basically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think that, yeah, what that, this group is doing is interesting, because I know there there is a group of, maybe it's the same researchers, actually, who they believe that the, the therapeutic benefit in psychedelics is because it kind of reopens your brain to what you were like as a child yeah this reversion um, to childlike states exactly. or whatever yeah 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 so and yeah there and then yeah that would be so interesting that like um they would they, they'd almost be treating you like a child and yeah that, that is really interesting i'd be interested, interested to see how that plays out yeah i haven't seen a lot of like actual studies coming out of it but i just yeah. know that there is this like psychoanalytic i think they call it like psychoanalytic something psychedelic group in i believe it's switzerland but yeah mm-hmm. the i it just seems yeah i don't know dangerous <laughs> to me like if you really <laughs> want to mess somebody up just because you have all of those stories right like this is again one of the one of the negative things that people don't talk about i think enough with psychedelics and you mentioned how there's sort of this culty atmosphere around psychedelics 
but there's a lot of documented cases of authoritarian, really terrible cults using psychedelics. I mean, the Manson family mm -hmm. obviously is the obvious one. But if you look, yeah. there's a writer, Jules Evans, and he's written a few yeah, pieces. Yeah, I love Jules Evans yeah. stuff, yeah. He's written yeah. some stuff about this where there's like, mm -hmm. it kind of goes hand in hand. And it's something we don't think about, but it's like you put someone in this very vulnerable, subjective sort of wacky state, mm -hmm. of course you're going to be, a, like, it stands to reason. I mean, this is why the military, you know, thought they could harness <laughs> that power, you know? Yeah. So that's something that we don't, we don't really talk about either. So yeah. it's... It's a little scary. And how, again, how do you develop a system where you're protecting people from that sort of, you know, there's the obvious, you know, abuse that happens. That's also been documented. I think it's fairly rare, but people under the mm -hmm. influence being sexually abused or whatever. But just in mm -hmm. general, like this whole, like, I don't know, kind of subjective nature, getting so into it. And then you find yeah. your guru. And I feel yeah. like the psychoanalytics thing, I, there seems to be in society now, again, like this, this want for people to be told how to do it. Right. Mm. And I always, I'm a big critic of the health and wellness space because mm -hmm. there's so much of that, right? Like just do this meditation, just do this, you know, yoga, whatever, you know, this is how you change your life. And like social media has just like commodified that. And so you add psychedelics into this mix and it's just like, it's just ripe for people to get, Mm. you know, grifted in a very mm. negative way, I think. Yeah. And I think I can totally see the appeal, uh, appeal from someone who, you know, has been suffering with mental illness for a long time and, um, you know, like treatment resistant depression, say, and their antidepressants haven't worked. They've tried everything. Um, and, you know, they read an article about, oh, you just need to trip for eight hours and that's it. And afterwards you'll feel so much better. It feels almost kind of like a one and done kind of silver bullet. I can absolutely understand the appeal of that. Um, but yeah, what you're talking about with like the cults and stuff like that, I think is so interesting. I think there was a paper recently talking about the dangers of false beliefs um, amongst people who have had psychedelic experiences because, you know, you trip, um, you have this idea during your trip um, and then afterwards you kind of almost find it really hard to let go of that idea. And there was someone who wrote a Medium article recently about their, they had a really um, bad experience um, using psilocybin where they had a they had a really good trip experience um, but during their trip they had this idea of like how their next career move which they'd been thinking about for a while and then after the trip they started like putting um, stuff into motion and like how to um, you know move into this new aspect of their career and uh, you yeah, know, it sounded it sounded like pretty positive. They were like calling mm -hmm. people, telling them about this idea, all that kind of stuff. And then they were calling people, and they wouldn't stop calling people. And it got to the point where their family intervened. They they called their um, psychiatrist, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, they'd almost, and I think they ended up, I think, being diagnosed with like a manic um, episode. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I think, and I think something that we didn't talk about as well, and symposia, which are like a kind of watchdog for the psychedelic industry. I have done a lot of work on this is kind of the right wing, um, infiltration of the psychedelic space. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and also you touched on that a little bit with the military. Um, and yeah, I think that's a really interesting aspect as well. And there was a, I think it was a veteran recently who was at a music festival and I think he killed two people. Yikes. Um, while he was tripping on mushrooms, um, obviously I don't know. I don't know if that strictly has a connection to, yeah. <laughs> to right wing. Um, I'm going to go out on a well, limb and say it didn't help. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I think yes. Yeah, I think that's a really um, interesting aspect as well. Like, I mean, we have this idea that um, you know um, Rick Doblin, who's head of Maps, has this idea of net zero trauma mm -hmm. that will heal everyone's trauma. Um, but we, I guess in this idea, we have this kind of this beautiful idea of humanity. Um, but, you know, maybe there's going to be people who are interested in this space using psychedelics who maybe we don't necessarily want them um, to be kind of leading this movement. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I think that brings up a lot of interesting questions. Yeah, there's a... I mean, we're kind of verging into the, the the space outside of the clinic, which you had the article about Oregon on, which I'd like to talk mm -hmm. about as well. Um, but just on the the nature of this, you know, the the quick fix thing is is one that I, I understand the appeal of, but I also think that there is in a lot of the 
the the structures that are being built about um, psychedelics sort of outside of the clinic? Because I feel like the stuff that, that you know, is kind of based on CBT and, and whatnot, that is kind of mm. going through the trials, there is a very hands-off approach, right, where it's like the therapy really happens after the experience, right? And then it's that mm. integration thing, right? Yeah. But when you look at sort of you know, let's say the underground retreats, you know, ayahuasca mm -hmm. comes to mind where mm -hmm. they always put this, there's like a hierarchical th nature to it where the shaman person is the one that, you know, guides you through and, and does this thing. And, and some are better than others, I'm sure, in terms of being hands off yeah. or hands on. And that's going to be different for every person. But you really are kind of setting up a power dynamic that is very exploitable. Like it, mm. it just seems like really <laughs> we need to be aware of that. And there was an interesting, I interviewed a guy at uh, the Insight Conference that goes on in Berlin uh, every couple mm -hmm. of years. Um, and he's an anthropologist. And he was actually making the case that a lot of these, uh, you know, ritualistic, shamanistic ways in which people are using these things, there's no evidence that tribes, that's how they used it. He was like, in yeah. a lot of ways, they used it as the shaman would take the the medicine and then he would be able to commune with the spirits and then tell you what they said. Or he would, you know, possess the enemy village and kill their babies, you know, like it's very dark. Like <laughs> it's mm. like not this, not this sort of, you know, totally different than the way that it's being portrayed now. So it's like, yeah. you can just kind of see that there, there's this darker side that's like right there that we're just maybe glossing over a little bit yeah yeah i think we totally have i've had that i've had that pushback as well before that like we have this very westernized idea of um how indigenous tribes use psychedelics that we actually don't know maybe are mischaracterizing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and yeah it's I a mean, comforting story but yeah yeah for sure for sure the idea that people have been using this for so long um it kind of lends some some credence to it that maybe we're sorely needing um yeah the underground um networks i don't know a ton of that but yeah they sound pretty dodgy <laughs> yeah and then and Some then yet you hear you know on every other comedian's podcast there's like yeah. a story about i went to costa rica and now i don't, I don't drink anymore and it's like okay great, yeah you know yeah maybe maybe they're going to the expensive ones <laughs> well yeah for sure yeah i yeah. think that's i think that's part of it yeah um but then, so then this is like the other area of my interest. And again, you, you, you seem to really capture a nice moment uh, of it because of the sort of, let's call it like experiment that's going on in Oregon. And that is, you know, these things just outside of the clinic. So we have this sort of, we can call it decent to okay evidence that there's, there's benefit there for certain mental illnesses. But then part of the whole hype that's happening around this, you know, you want to call it psychedelic renaissance or whatever, is just this sort of lifestyle aspect of it, right? Like microdosing in the in the tech world and and you know that that we all could benefit from, you know, this experience in a way. Again, I think a lot of the problems are are still there of like it's not just the drug, like it's what do you do after it's or what is the environment and all of these kind of things. So places are moving to legalize, decriminalize, and mm. Oregon is one of them. But they mm. <laughs> seem to have a very uh, confusing uh, mandate or, or, or law on the books as to how this is going to happen. And you wrote a great piece about it. Um, so why don't you explain that one to us? What is happening in Oregon? Yeah. So, well, you're, I mean, confusing is the only word for it, I think. So... <laughs> I think it was 2020 they passed um, Measure 109, which basically, I mean, kind of just kind of looks like a decrim policy. Um, basically, under this policy, people can take psychedelics, but it's pretty stringent. You have to be under the supervision of a facilitator um, who has done like, I think it's like 160 hours of training. They don't need to be a therapist or anything like that. Um, they just have to have a high school diploma and I think live in Oregon and then they do their training and then they're basically like a trip sitter. Um, they don't do any therapy whatsoever. They're actually forbidden from offering therapy, even if they are a licensed therapist. Mm -hmm. If they were to say, you know, tell me about your childhood, that would be technically against 
the measure. Um, and really what there's what what the better best term for it, which is kind of a weird term, is supported adult use. Um, <laughs> and I mean honestly to me, like speaking um by from a biased perspective, I think this sounds really appealing. Like as someone who I mean I uh, full disclosure have never done psychedelics mm. before, but if I were to that sounds really appealing to me. Like I, I maybe don't necessarily want to do psychedelic assisted therapy just yet, but um, if I could do it in a safe environment where someone was like keeping an eye on me, um, you could choose to have integration afterwards. Um, although I'm not really sure what that entails um, at the moment, but um, I think that sounds appealing. Um, the fact that I think, you know, again, the money issue comes into it again. I think it's going to be minimum like 3.5 K us dollars to do that, which is, um, has caused a lot of backlash in the community. Like it's kind of who's actually going to be able to afford to, why would you pay 3.5K to trip when you could just do it underground? Mm -hmm. um, but basically, yeah, confusion. I think there's confusion even on the people, on the committee who are organizing this because they've just been kind of throwing around the word psychedelic assisted therapy, using the word therapy a lot, when really this is strictly not therapy by their own rules. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like even even recently they were, I think, in court because they're trying to add in an aspect to the bill where they collect data on this. Um, and I'm not I'm not quite sure what they're actually intending the data for. I think they plan to send it to um, the research um, arm of the biggest hospital in Oregon. Um, so and maybe you know maybe that could be used to kind of bolster the evidence that um, psilocybin works um, therapeutically. But um, when they were in court, the person who was there, who was on the committee, I believe, kept referring to the mental health benefits of psychedelics, mm -hmm. um, which, like, again, just doesn't make any sense. If this, if they, if they themselves have strictly gone down this non-therapeutic route, that means de facto that they should be able to refer to the mental health benefits of the psychedelics. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like the media was definitely guilty in this as well. They really like that word was bandied around a lot as well. Therapy. Um, but when I when I reached out to the I think like the, the like the comms department of um, the psilocybin advisory board, their kind of response was, you know, the word therapy is subjective. Like some people refer to <laughs> yoga as therapy or, you know, going for a swim as therapy. Um, that was kind of their get out of jail free card. Um because I guess people do have very different de different mm -hmm. de different different um definitions of the word therapy. Like to me, therapy um, is by a licensed therapist um, who's had a lot of training, mm -hmm. um, who's supervised in some way. But yeah, to some to, to other people, maybe they do define it differently. Um, but yeah, I thought it does seem to be kind of a big yeah swamp of confusion over in Oregon. But what's really interesting is that Colorado, who I think there is, is probably not going to start until like 2025, they have gone down the therapeutic rush. Or I think there's some debate whether you call it therapeutic or medicalized. Um, yeah, they, they're, they're going down the whole therapeutic run and that's going to be really interesting to see what happens when FDA approval comes in. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's cool that you have all these little experiments going on. I mean, it's again, a little terrifying in a way, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. and it's, it's always, I'm always amazed that it's, it's the U S that is, you know, on there first, you know, that was the one place that <laughs> it was like, like when they started legalizing marijuana, even before Canada did. I was always like, seriously, yeah. we're going to be number two in this? Like, <laughs> this is like, we should have been, we should have been on this, you know? Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, it's, it's the definitions, right. Become really important. And I think that's the thing is that there is no definition and it's exactly what we were talking about from the clinical side. There is no real mm. definition as to what mm -hmm. psychedelic assisted therapy is. I mean, you kind of have to, I think, accept that that there is going yeah. to be grayness in that area because yeah. of the nature of therapy, right? Yeah. And then the nature of psychedelics themselves that yeah. you can have the same people in the same environment, take the same dosage. One has a great time. The other one is scarred for life. You know, like mm -hmm. there's just, there's not a lot we can do on that. But I think the definitions of therapy versus I find this therapeutic is, mm. is important when it comes to Oregon. And the thing that, troubles me about that is that it's like yeah again i can see what they're trying to do and like just let's do this where you have a supervisor like someone just to keep you safe 
Uh, mm. But we're not going to call it therapy because that's going to bring in all of these other like liability questions and accreditation questions and maybe make it too expensive. Like I get that. Yeah. But it's like the fact that they can't define it and like sort of sort through it or like haven't mm. thought about it in this way mm. is a little like. I know some people in the European community that I talk to that have researched this, they do kind of feel like that places like maps and the U S sort of mentality of like, you know, cognitive libertarianism or whatever they, you know, yeah. these terms, they're like, they're going to fuck it up. That's what, that's kind of what they say to me sort of off the record, you know, it's just like, yeah. we're worried that it's like, it's going to go too far too fast. And then we're going to have this problem. But uh, yeah, I really don't know. I feel like it's going to have to be something where there's a lot of different models to it, you know, where you have like the different options, so to speak, mm -hmm. or you just legalize it, you know, and I, yeah. I, you just, just legalize it and sort of trust people to be responsible. I don't, I don't know if that jives with everybody, but you know, yeah. as someone that has done psychedelics, not in a long time, you know, but like as a as a high school, you know, like or a young mm -hmm. adult, <laughs> yeah, I I saw people have bad experiences. Most of the stuff I saw from people was overwhelmingly positive, mm -hmm. but now in my in my older years, I definitely understand having somebody there that's sober to yeah to just sort of keep an eye on things you know yeah like i wouldn't yeah. want to be that person that'd be like hurting cats you know it'd be terrible but <laughs> you know th that makes sense to me but like how, yeah. how hard is it then to just define like why why do they need to be this like facilitator but just make it a nurse or something like i don't know like mm. doesn't it seem like there's an easier way i don't know yeah yeah, I think to be really cynical, I feel like some of the companies in the space push for the idea of a therapist being there because they can make more money that way. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I think that's another part of it as to why that so much money mixing around this area kind of makes it a bit grainy. Um, but something you touched on just there, which I think is kind of a disclaimer I want to make, and you probably feel the same way too, is that like I... Um, I'm definitely like not a prohibitionist. I mm -hmm, probably, mm -hmm. I, I mean, to be fully transparent, like I believe in decriminalization and, and if these drugs do work, like people want them to amazing. I think that's amazing. And I'm all for it. We desperately need new ways to treat mental illness. I just think as a journalist, um, it also deserves just as much scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely, there's definitely a lot of corners being taken that I think are worth examining. But I always feel like that yeah, it's, a, it's a tough line to toe. I don't want to sound like I'm anti-drugs or whatever. Like I'm definitely not, I'm, I'm neutral on them. Um, I just think there's some maybe nefarious activity going on in this space that's worth examining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the thing that gets me is the, a lot is the, yeah, I definitely think, you know, like as, a, as an adult, you should be able to do what you want as long as you're mm -hmm. not harming other people, right? Like it's kind of a pretty... <laughs> vanilla you know definition of what i think most people think right um but and i used to be i've said this a million times on this podcast every time i talk about psychedelics i used to be of the state of mind you know again in my youth when i had explored these things was like mm -hmm. oh if everybody did this it would just the world would be a better place you know yeah and it's like as you kind of learn more about it and just think logically about it like if that was true then all of the people that took these in the 60s and 70s would all be amazing super realized <laughs> human beings and it like it would it would be done over the conversation yeah, would be yeah. over <laughs> obviously that didn't happen so what you know what's going on there's something else going mm -hmm. on and i think that that's the really important i think that the the research community and the people that are having discussions about this have kind of and i lean on this side maybe there is a debate still that like you just take the drug and then that's it, you know, that you're, yeah. you're, you're cured or you, you, you have everything you need to then improve your life. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I think a lot mm -hmm. more, I, I, I tend to side with the, and it seems like a bigger voice. I don't have, again, have data on the number of papers saying one or the other, that it's like, it's not just the experience itself. It's what you do after. It's how you deal with this. Right. So we have the yeah. therapy angle, which again, we talked is not super defined, they're kind of figuring it out as you go. And now we have this opening up uh, to outside of the clinic. And again, I think the, the, the 
the problems of media hype and expectation are going to be even higher in that space because of all the media attention and all the Michael Pollan's books, all the podcast, yeah, everything that we see. So when it comes to this, like, you know, all these, you know, middle class people that have stress and anxiety about their life or whatever, or they got a cancer diagnosis or something, and then they go and take this thing and it's like, it maybe didn't do what they want. Like, are we setting people up for this expectation? And is it just yeah. going to become like all of the other health trends, right? Like all the diet yeah. trends or oh, just try this one. Oh, it didn't work for you. Yeah. Oh, well then you just try this one or you got to take it in this context or you got to take this one or you got to. And so that really, you know, bothers me. And I did an episode just like two episodes back where I had gone to one of these workshops that was put on again by, have you heard of the Mind Foundation? They're yeah, out of Berlin. Have, yeah. yeah. So I've interviewed yeah. them a number of times. I've gone to their conference. I kind of know them pretty well. And they offer this workshop. It's like a four day workshop about integration, you know, like mm. of your psychedelic experiences. And so mm. I went with the, with the idea of making a podcast about this. And the thing that like, you know, the big question I have, and I still have is like, I kind of feel like just sort of opening it up and being like, yeah, you just try it. And then you can just, you know, there's tips and tricks to try and like integrate and stuff. But it's like, we're going to basically, there's no bounds on the interpretations that you can make. There's no guidance in terms of like, what is a meaningful interpretation versus mm -hmm. a not, I mean, you know, and mm -hmm. it comes down a lot to like my problems I have with the really esoteric sort of interpretations of these things. Like, Ooh, mother ayahuasca will just tell you what you need to see. You know, I'm like, that doesn't yeah. seem like a healthy context for this, you know, <laughs> like that seems, yeah. but in speaking with some of the people at this workshop and sort of kind of going through it, the things that I kind of came away with is like, you kind of have to trust people. And I think what the Mind Foundation is trying to do with this program is at least build a space where people can talk about it, right? Like people that have, are exploring it. Mm -hmm. And they really uh, emphasize the social aspect of it, that like mm -hmm. don't get isolated and that you have to, you have to constantly be, you know, bringing these things to your social group, to your peer group, so that you can better understand them and know when you're kind of veering off. And again, it all kind of sounds very common sense, but it's something that I think that like, yeah, like the psychedelic community isn't really talking about what are the cultural containers? What are the contexts? How are yeah. we going to, for a society that really has no experience with this and has mm -hmm. lived in it as being demonized for, you know, you know, obviously I think the younger generations don't view it that way, but their parents and stuff lived in this war on drugs Wait. era. Yeah. It just, yeah, I just, I wonder, I mean, I'm fascinated, but I'm also worried. Like, how's it going to go? You know? Yeah. I don't know how you feel, but like when I am hanging out with friends and people start talking about psychedelics, I just want to get up and put on like a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> <laughs> about like all the nuances of it. And then, and then I hear people microdosing and stuff like that. And I want to be like, oh, but there's not actually like not a ton of evidence to show that that yeah, works yeah, or, yeah. Um, all that kind of stuff. Um, I find that like, I almost feel like it's a curse knowing so much about it yeah. um, because you become that annoying person at the party who's like, well, actually. Yeah. Actually, there's no um, evidence. I'm used to being that annoying yeah. person, you know, amongst my <laughs> peer groups. So we could just chat at the party. Yeah. Um, with something you talked about Jules Evans and I think he's doing really important work um, and it's something that we didn't touch on a ton, but it is this idea of negative experiences, um, which I think have traditionally been pretty swept under the carpet, I think, in mm -hmm. this in this community. Um, and I think it's partly it's because I think I think it's Roland Griffiths has always said, you know, sometimes the worst trips are like the most beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and again, I think something Nishay Devano says in her editorial, like there's never been any evidence to show that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, it's like one of those truisms that we've always just kind of taken for granted. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've read a little bit about people's, people, some people have written like really open and honest um, accounts of their experiences. They sound pretty harrowing to me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and, you know, there's other negative aspects like um, HPPD, hallucinogenic um, perception persisting disorder. Is that it? I can't remember. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. 
and you know you could, you could have tripped and like a few years later just realized like the walls around you were moving um and again that to me that doesn't sound super pleasant um and I think I know like of course like these are pretty rare these negative experiences are pretty rare for the most part but I do think there's something that should be acknowledged and also should be studied and I think that's why Jules Evans work um is really important mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I think there's something sort of like I don't know, the idea of, you know, embracing the the bad, you know, like that whole like going through the like that, that's an mm. idea in therapy, I think, as well of mm. like, you know, yeah. not avoidance and, you know, coming, you know, rather than that's where the symptoms come from is your avoidance mechanisms of yes. the thing that's bothering you, you have to go through it, you know, so it, and I think it feels like a, like a, like a logical idea. You know, to a yeah, lot of people, it, intuitively it, it feels yeah, right. It yeah. feels right, yeah. and so then it's like, then you just the explanation of like, well, yeah, you just take a psychedelic that helps you unlock that even more. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. yeah, that that makes sense, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, well, again, we don't. I don't think we really know, and I don't know that we ever will. And I don't know. It's yeah, I. I Again, going to the person at the party, you know, when this when this stuff comes up, you know, like it's I'm I'm really torn on it because yes, having taken the skeptical lens to it that I have, um, I don't want to go too far the other way, right? Like mm. I don't want to mm-hmm. become so skeptical that you lose that mystery, right? Like because mm. again, not now this is like I'm totally not being the scientific side of it, but like there is something interesting and sort of mysterious there. And when you talk to yeah. about things about like human psychology and, you know, our emotions and, you know, spirituality or whatever it is, there's, we're obviously drawn to that, you know, and mm-hmm. I don't, I just, I, I don't know how to play with those ideas because I kind of like, you know, sort of rejected my Christian upbringing and, you know, went to like really <laughs> science, you yeah. know, but I kind of want to feel like, is there, what, what is the space for mystery, you know, and what is the role yeah. of that? And is that part of you know the benefit that people can get you know is is applying this sort of other not otherworldly but you know let's think of like just the classic you know uh one with nature or something Mm. like that like you Mm. don't want to reduce that down to you know like just that wow you just that's just your brain chemistry you know like because that could be a useful feeling i don't know but then this is comes to like i I have these sort of same thoughts about just therapy in general right (laughs) i don't know yeah i know completely yeah i completely i'm sure it's just having um having a research background you just have that drilled into you and i definitely suffer from like a a very pragmatic, rationalist, utilitarian standpoint when, I, <laughs> when I'm talking about something. And, you know, when people are talking about the slightly more woo-woo aspects of it, which are just as bad as, like, the spirituality aspect, the mysticism aspect, um, I do struggle with that a little bit because, yeah, like, like I'm sure you are as well. Um, it's not really something I bring into my everyday life a ton. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not valid and something that should be researched and explored and maybe is like a really crucial element of um that drug experience um but yeah i definitely like struggle (laughs) with talking about it (laughs) um and like my my first instinct is probably to roll my eyes but that's my own fault yeah 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 yeah. no i know and and that was like this workshop experience i did like this is what like this is what i was confronted with was just like you know am i just being Am I being closed off to something, Mm -hmm. which is then, you know, the exact opposite of what I wanted to be doing, you know, Mm -hmm. like, and and the idea Mm -hmm. of looking for, you know, the truth or the, you know, when you're talking about journalism and science and stuff like this, but then I'm just, and I'm not saying in terms of like, are ghosts real or are the spirits real? You know, like I, I don't think they are, you know, (laughs) but I spoke, (laughs) yeah, for the record, but I spoke with one guy who's a therapist and, uh, he's training to be a psychedelic assisted therapist. And he was like, just the way that he said it was very, it was more compassionate than what I was giving it credit for, where Mm. he was like, look, when I was on ayahuasca, I don't know that the spirits are real. Maybe they're real. Maybe they're not. But he's like, at that moment, there was no other way to explain it was that there was Mm. another entity, you know, speaking to me. Mm. So he's like, I don't view that as a, as a wrong interpretation or a flawed interpretation of the experience now afterwards what do i do with that 
that's the sort of question, right? Yeah. But it was just like, yeah. I was like, okay, yeah, that makes me feel a little bit better because I yeah. was like, I felt really guilty in this workshop where like people were kind of exploring these things and it was very open, like it was a really like open setting that like I hadn't really experienced before, you know, mm. like people just being really open about stuff. And uh, I didn't want to be the guy that was like, well, maybe that's, maybe there is no spirit, you know? And it wasn't like, yeah. I would say the majority of people that were there, like 95% of people there weren't overly like woo woo about it, but there was still okay. like, yeah. I think it's just that when you're dealing with these kind of experiences, there's just something yeah. ineffable about it that mm -hmm. it's like so how do we so that's kind of the gray area that i feel like right now and why i'm kind of drawn to some of the stuff that the mind foundation is doing is because they seem to kind of embrace that as well like mm. they're trying to like when i talk to the people that run that organization they're like we really try to at our conferences and stuff it's like there's hard science there's also art there's also dance mm -hmm. there's music there's you know and then there's philosophy and i think that's something that is really interesting to me. And I think just in general for science, we could do with adding a little more philosophy into our training, you know, as scientists, because yeah. like yeah. so much of, you know, science, philosophy and philosophy deals with some of these things that we can't put under a microscope and, you know, but it gives you a way to discuss them, to explain them. So yeah, it's, I don't know, maybe I'm now sounding like I'm kind of too far out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think my interpretation is that this is something that the psychedelic field is uniquely good at is being so interdisciplinary and mm -hmm. listening to other people's experiences and bringing in, you know, different cultures and stuff like that, um, which I definitely think is to its benefit. Um, I definitely think with something like psychedelic assisted therapy, um, I think therapy today I mean, I, I've, I've done CBT and I've gotten a lot out of it, but I think I've seen the people make the critique that it, it's the perfect therapy for um, capitalism because, you know, it has an end point. Yeah. <laughs> it has an end point. It has, has all these results you have to meet and then you can just boot the person out the door. Um, whereas maybe other forms of therapy are like more ongoing, a little bit more ambiguous. Um, and yeah, and I think I think that's something that maybe psychedelic therapy um, offer is is that it's a little bit more um you know divide uh what's the word i'm thinking of you know hopefully we can kind of keep it safe from you know the pulls of capitalism <laughs> yeah 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 for sure yeah for sure well and yeah. again this was something that one of the co-founders of the of the mind foundation you know said to me when i was asking him about that after doing this workshop and being like you know i worry about you know people going into this looking for that answer right like the quote the last truth, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's fixed, mm -hmm. now everything. And he was like, you look at all of these cultures, all of our cultures, humans in general, like we're still asking those questions. So he's mm -hmm. like, so maybe the point is that like, there is no, like you never get the answer. <laughs> yeah. And the way, again, yeah. the way he said it was just like, you kind of feel silly because it's like, yeah, that sounds so obvious. <laughs> why, did, <laughs> why did I think about that? But it's yeah. like, it's still, you know, I don't know, I can't, it's not there. And so then maybe that's it is like coming to terms with this. And this is just my, per again, my personal thoughts on this and something I'm, you know, kind of explored by doing this podcast is like, what are my own personal thoughts on it? And then maybe mm -hmm. there is a softening of that, that like, kind of like what you said, we don't necessarily need to know exactly how it works, if it's working for mm -hmm. some people or it's helping some mm -hmm. people. Um, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a really fascinating space. Yeah. We could start uh, winding it up now before I go too much into the <laughs> my, <laughs> my uh, conflicting thoughts on on how much mysticism should be, you know, acceptable. <laughs> um, so I assume you plan to keep following up on this. I don't know if you I obviously don't want to spoil anything that you're working on, but do you have other, you know, threads that you're pulling that you're looking at in this space or... Yeah, something that we touched on a little bit um, was, you know, what who they tend to exclude from clinical trials tends to be people who have either had um, a psychotic episode or been diagnosed with a psychotic disorder or someone in their family has had a psychotic disorder. And I was at a breaking convention, which is um, the psychedelics conference they hold, um, I think they hold it in the UK um, every year. And someone from there um, was talking about Again, you know, something that seems to be kind of a common thread in this conversation is there also isn't a ton of evidence to support that psychedelics 
worsen psychotic disorders hmm. um which i mean i i like I, this is very much just like a thread of thread of an idea and something i need to look into more but they've recently also just announced funding for a clinical trial in the us um that i think is going to be looking at mdma to treat schizophrenia um if i remember correctly i think i saw that yeah yeah um so i think i think that's really interesting if it is the case that you know we have kind of um, jumped the chase on this a little bit too quickly and maybe are excluding a whole bunch of people who pot- uh, potentially could be benefiting from these experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, and then also that that paper I was talking about, the false beliefs paper, um, I think is really interesting. And I think I want to delve maybe into the, the cult-like aspects of psychedelics a little bit more because i also think that is really interesting it's something that i think um a lot of people in the field are coming out um maybe a little bit more critically against Mm -hmm. um as of late yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i think there's something there with the sort of you know psychedelics and cults seem to go hand in hand but i do think that there's also something about the sort of i don't know millennial whatever zeitgeist right now where they're really seems to be this like wanting to be a group wanting to be identifying as something Mm, as part of this something a community yeah a community and so like what is going on with that you know and i think social media tiktok you know you could there's a lot of threads and i don't really have the clear idea as to what it is but i do feel like psychedelics is becoming one of these what are the consequences of that given that it is kind of has this history of Mm. I don't know, facilitating <laughs> cult like behavior. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know, like just yeah, all of these health and health and wellness trends that we see. Mm-hmm. There's like a, mm-hmm. to me, like a, a resurgence of guruism too. You know, like people Definitely. like really searching for that. So I don't know. I think you might be onto something there too. And it's yeah, it's something I'm fascinating and fascinated with as well. So mm. I'll be uh, I'll be following I'll be following along with your stuff at at Wired. Uh, and yeah thank you so much for for taking some time out of your day i really appreciate it it's my pleasure it's super fun yeah well you know anytime anytime you want to come back it'd be great to chat sounds good <laughs> all right my sincerest thanks to grace brown staff writer at wired for joining the show uh, it was a great conversation i really enjoyed it uh lots of questions lots of interesting questions and things to follow in this space i think that's one of the reasons why we're both so interested in talking about it and writing about it there's just a lot going on so get in touch with anything uh, any questions comments about this episode at two brad for you on instagram and x formerly known as twitter uh, website to brad for you dot wordpress.com and as always please rate review subscribe wherever you're getting your podcasts that really helps us out um i think that's everything so take care everyone bye for now <laughs>